Uh, what a lad. Well, with the Rugby World Cup just around the corner, there's only one man we all need to hear from right now. He was the one who was responsible for keeping the country calm as he guided the All Blacks to the 2011 Rugby World Cup. As well as being one of the all-time All Black greats, he's also a true Wellington and Hurricane legend who has also had stints for Auckland and the Blues, London Welsh, the Wasps in England and a couple of other clubs that are hard to pronounce in France. And of course he finished with the mighty White Upper Bush. Since footy he's been the star of his own TV show. He's also been on the reality show Matchfit for a couple of seasons now. Everyone knows that he is a lad. He's actually one of the great lads. It is, of course, Pity Weepu. Welcome, brother. Thank you, brother. I don't know about that intro. It's a bit <laughs> full on, man. <laughs> but too much. <laughs> we all know you're a very humble man. I know you don't even really talk about being an all-black and all that sort of stuff anymore, eh? You like to keep it very low-key. Oh, you, you've been obviously been talking to some of my... Uh, Cousins and uh, and friends. <laughs> well, I don't speak too much about my uh, my career much, but yeah. <laughs> Do people still recognise you out on the street and stuff? Yep, I actually um, yeah. had a few people ask me for a photo the other day, but it was it wasn't because of the photo; it was because of my TV series now. Oh, true. Yeah. Uh, oh, we watch your show all the time, and yeah. I'm like, chair. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's cool. That way, you've still got that. Um identity within the public i guess yeah and plus like more recently a lot of people have been slagging well not slagging me mostly all my mates anyway i've been going to a few function i've been rocking up in my red band so they're slaying <laughs> me when i when i'm like going to a uh tidy event everyone's wearing suit dress shoes and all that and all Maldi boys rocking up with bloody red bands <laughs> i did see that actually <laughs> where was that that was like a, a function somewhere right with Colin yeah, Slade, Slady, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, Slady in Forsyth Bar uh, had organised a uh, a breakfast, and there was um, Jonah uh, and Victor were were sort of on a on a panel, oh, yeah. and uh, Kim was there, and um, I think I, I've spoke I've spoken to a few people since then. And I said that probably the I'm the first person I've ever seen walk in, walk into the Wellington <laughs> Club with a red band <laughs> in an event that looked very, very uh, tidy. You couldn't convince Victor to wear the red bands as well. <laughs> oh no, nah. I think I because uh, he seen me a, a week before oh, yeah. at a uh, at a at a luncheon and I was rocking my red bands then and he was like, you know, actually. I couldn't get away with that. <laughs> I said, that's because you're a Scots education, mate. Your Scots college education wouldn't allow you to wear something like that. <laughs> mate, you could bring it back. How good would that be? Everyone just wearing gumboots to functions. Save the dress shoes. The worst shoes ever. As long as they're not bloody uh, dirty. Usually, like, if they're putty from being out on the farm or trying to act like I go hunting, you just put them at the front door and you're rocking, rocking your socks. <laughs> Yeah, you'd need one clean one and one one for use. And obviously, you're you're out yeah. all the time now. Doing, are you still um, recording your your show? Uh, not at the moment. Like we've we've finished um, edit. I've uh, finished editing the TV series, and uh, that's going to go to air in October. True. So is that season three? Uh, season six. Season six. <laughs> Holy heck! Yeah, man. Well, the dream, the 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 bros' um, idea, Bailey's idea, was to um, try and have. 71 episodes yeah. uh, being I played 71 tests and I thought oh is that a stretch cause like are we going to be make, making it that far but I think you know I think this year might have been uh, there or thereabouts I think All right. how cool so, is that are you loving it oh yeah absolutely it's been it's been awesome like just you know you go to you, people talk about all these places um, and you know you, you sort of just fly and fly up mm. You don't actually get to meet like the actual people that live there on a day to day basis kind of thing. So meeting heaps of locals that just love hunting, fishing, yeah. diving, just gathering food. But not only that, they don't just just do it for themselves, they actually, you know, give it out to the community too. Yeah. And that's been the best part about it, the most rewarding part is for every person that I've gone out with, you know, they've all got um, something in common, which is they might go out, their freezers might be full, so they just go and fill everyone else's freezers. Right, that's cool, eh? And, like, the best thing is, like, when you go to someone that um, does hunting, you take seafood to them, bro, 
you come back with like venison and wild pork. It's so good. <laughs> and then vice versa, everyone that lives on the near the ocean, you know, if you take wild meat to them, yeah, they'll, they'll happily take that off you for a bit of koi. Right? How good is that? And how did that even um, come about? How did you fall into the whole Pity's Tiki tours? Oh, I got asked when I was living in Auckland um, from Bailey if I'd be interested in, you know, presenting a TV show. And I'm, in my head, I was thinking, mm, am I even going to be good enough to sort of present a TV series? Um, but then I ended up signing and going overseas. Yeah. So I ended up, I was like, I forgot to tell him that, you know, he was like, um, what happened to you? What would you <laughs> sorry, cause, uh, just gonna go overseas for a couple of years and have a, have a nosy at the competition. And then, uh, if it's still, uh, on the table, then yeah, sweet. But yeah, had a quarter when I was living in Auckland, went away, come back, um, from overseas. And, um, the network were pretty keen. Multi TV was still keen to, well, they asked if I was still keen. Mm. And I was like, yes, yeah, sweet. Keen, that's us. Yeah. So, it, yeah, it started from about three years beforehand. Um, and then when they said if I was still interested, I was like, I'm not doing anything else. Yeah, why not? Might, might just keep myself busy. Yeah. And what was it like doing it? Were, were, you, were you nervous? Um, oh. Obviously, presenting and um, hosting your own show. Especially the release, I'd imagine, eh? Like, probably more so releasing it to the to the world. Well, you, you think about it. When we're all those years of us doing press conferences, conferences for like, you know, bloody media and all that, we're real yeah. short and sharp with our answers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we don't give too much away. I remember the first one, the first episode we did, which was down in um, Arahura and Hoki, where my, my family's from. And um, I did it with my, my cousin and my uncle. And um, they were asking me questions in my master interview. And I was real short with my answers, just because, you know, we that's what <laughs> yeah. we've been. Yeah told to to pick three things yeah exactly (laughs) three things make sure you push these three subjects and then just keep honing in honing in on that so i was real short and sharp with my answers and because the best part is my older brother was a a camera operator oh true so billy was um there and he's like hang on oi you can actually open up it's not like media (laughs) you know where you're real short and sharp so he knew straight away yeah and um after that yeah it was I, i felt all good after that. I guess it helps if I have my older brother there the whole time. Yeah. So it's been good. We've been sort of doing this together. Oh, true. So he's he's one of the film men on the on the show. Yeah. So he's um he's worked for TV three for oh, for years because he used to come up to to training up at Rugby League Park and mm. you know try and pick an angle where he's trying to say that I've got the fattest ass <laughs> in the family by getting shots of me <laughs> from behind. I'm like, mate, you're looking really awkward right now with, with uh, some of these pictures. But um, yeah, he's, he, did, he did that for oh, for years. And then I thought, you know, if they asked, I was like, I'll only do it if my older brother is the camera operator. And we've been doing it together since. Far out. And just plans to keep going, keep, keep on rolling? Oh, Maybe a movie. Nah, no way. <laughs> We've already done that. Troy Kingy was me. Oh, true. They picked the, they picked the perfect guy. I mean, my my voice is real good. Not. <laughs> but, um, well, at the moment, like, we're sort of in a in a stage where after this season, um, the funding hasn't sort of, uh, isn't going to continue. Okay. Um, but what we're going to do is try and find, um, see if we can find sponsorship around i know it's a bit tough at the moment with a bit of a recession and all that Mm. but uh, we're going to try and figure out how we can uh, make a plan to see see if we can still continue the the dream surely well with all the what lad listeners listening who love um the show they'll they'll be getting in behind you and surely it will keep going forever that show it is one of the greats but one thing i am keen to hear from uh you is a little bit more about your upbringing Uh, i know you grew up in wainuimata um, people love it out there. It's a pretty cool community when you're involved by the sounds of it. What was it like for you growing up out there? Oh, man, it was it was awesome. Um, I guess you don't sort of have the freedom that these kids have these days where you can just walk down the street with a ball and your mates. And uh, We probably shouldn't have done a few things like pass the ball across the road to your, to your cousin or your mate on the other side of the road and 
try and do it before a car comes. Um, <laughs> it's how you got your quick pass. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, mate. Oh, don't, don't hit the windscreen. But, um, I mean, I've got uh, lifelong friends that I grew up with. Um, you know, some of them played in the NRL. Um, I started one of my, uh, well, my other best mate in the, with our rugby career together with Namir. Mm. Um, so we started together in 2003 and literally retired. Well, I wouldn't say retired, but we pretty much finished our career together in Narbonne. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, it was, it was awesome. I mean, my second home other than mum and dad's house was, uh, the league club, Wanderer League Club. Oh, yeah. And so, you know, Tyrell's dad was there, Johnny, but his, his three brothers, well, four, there's four of them. The Lomax family is a you know a big part of um, our league club and, and our and our family up there. Uh, sure. Kim Laven, as yeah. everyone would hear him, he's um, you know one of the commentators for our NPC and mm. Super Rugby was on the uh, the World Series for for the Sevens. Yeah. Um, Tana, so Tana, Nami, and myself, we pretty much started our our careers at uh, at the league club. Everything we learned was through the league club, and then um, it's quite funny because we all started, well, we all became All Blacks too, um, yeah. with, a, with a massive league background. Um, Tyrell's the same. Tyrell grew up uh, playing league. Do you remember him as a kid? Yep, because he's he was hanging out quite a lot with my um, with my nephew. Oh, uh, they're they're Josh. They're pretty much the same age, so yeah. those two are were like this, yeah. and they still are today. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was just you know, I used to live quite a bit at my auntie's house or my cousins or at my grandmother's. Mm. Um, and when I had uh, when we went to intermediate, I used to go to intermediate with Namir as well. And so sometimes he'd walk past my grandparents' house, pick me up, we'd go to school after school, we'd come back because my grandparents are like always. Um, trying to feed all my myself and my mates and all my cousins, it, he used to just go and help himself. He was part of the furniture, <laughs> so he'd be coming in. A couple of other mates that I grew up with that lived just around the corner too. They'd come over, yeah. have a feed, go home, and be like getting a growling because <laughs> they bloody had a massive feed and it. What they're bloody doing is showing oh, you're not supposed to, you're supposed to hide all the uh, evidence, mate. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, I enjoyed my upbringing in Wainui. Yeah. Small community. Um, pretty much everyone knew everyone. Mm. I was running around in the, at, the, at the league trainings as at the age of five, uh, following my dad, and then obviously ball boy for the Lion Red back in the Lion Red days, in the late eighties, early nineties, um, and uh, you know we had guys that went over to the NRL, uh, well, um, Yogi Rogers, Ali Davies, um, David Lomax. And obviously Johnny as well. Tanner had a chance to go, um, but he obviously come home, got a bit homesick, come home, and I guess the rest is history with him. Yeah, know, become one of the greats uh, as a as a player for the Hurricanes, Lions, and in the ABs. So is that how you sort of moved into Union as well? Were you watching his path, or how did you end up going to Union? Oh, not by choice. True. <laughs> Mine. I went to boarding school and all they had was rugby. Oh, yeah. So I went to a Māori boarding school uh, called Te Ote and in the Hawke's Bay. And um, before I got there, my older brother had already been there. And they knew, after my brother was there, they knew that I'd probably go AWOL on a Sunday uh, just to go and play games of league on yeah. a Sunday. Yeah. Um, play play rugby said they try and hitchhike into bloody Hawks <laughs> Bay into Hastings and try and scab a game of league. But uh, because my brother did that before I got there, yeah. they kept a close eye on me. So I pretty much started playing like properly when I got to college. I had probably two games before that at Intermediate. Oh, really? Far out. I, it was only because my couple of my mates, were, no, like the team was short at Intermediate and they were like, oh, come and have a jam. I was like, but I don't even know the rules. There's too many rules. And they're like, no, no, all good. I remember 
first game I played, I tried to stand up and play the ball. <laughs> 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 tried to play the bloody ball, and I was like, ah, oh, yeah. I don't think I was supposed to do that. But they were looking at me, cracking up. I was like, oh, you sweet then. They tell me. <laughs> so you didn't know any of the rules, really. You were you didn't watch watch rugby, didn't watch the All Blacks or anything growing up. No, not at all. Like obviously being in boarding school, yeah. I did learn a little bit about um, um rugby up there. But yeah, I was even then. I was. Can we turn the the league on? I want to watch rugby. <laughs> I want to watch league. Yeah, far um, but by the time I got to the to my senior year, you know, I actually had a bit more interest in trying to watch a bit more rugby. Um, but yeah, the only reason I started playing was because I got sent to boarding school and they didn't have league. Man, that's crazy. You must have been pretty good at league then. Like, oh, 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 oh I was all right. I. I I went and played in the like a Rangatahi tournament, Maldives tournament, and got scouted there. Um, but I had already signed a, a an academy contract um, to uh, for Wellington and the Hurricanes. So, oh, what age was that? What age did you sign your Hurricanes one? Straight from this intermediate, eighteen <laughs> playing the ball. <laughs> nah, for me. <laughs> yeah, I'm striking the ball back. <laughs> Uh, no, I was I was uh, eighteen oh, yeah. when I signed that. So I obviously there's like the secondary schools tournaments, like hurricane schools and all that, where you can get looked at. Um, and then you know you play in those tournaments where you play the southern teams, yeah. the two Auckland teams, yeah. and obviously the hurricane re- region. So yeah, it was got signed at uh, eighteen with an academy contract. I didn't think much of it at the time. Yeah. I was just like, oh yeah, well, whatever. Yeah. See what see what happens uh, from it. But um, yeah, once I mentioned to them that I son, I was a uh, in an academy contract. I was like, nah, very well, because you should take me because <laughs> I wasn't getting paid. True. You know, it was just to try. I think it was just to try and lock me uh, and keep me in Wellington. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, they were <clears throat> one guy was chasing me, uh, quite, you know, hard out, um. And I just said, look, I, I I don't know if I can do anything about it because of this academy stuff that I've I've uh, signed. But if you want to come back three years in three years time, <laughs> when I'm finished, yeah, sweet. <laughs> A three year academy contract for nothing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, just do trainings early in the morning and at night before bloody club. Uh... <laughs> Were you always a halfback in Union? No, actually, I was. Um, they just put me wherever, really. Oh, true. No, obviously, first my first year at college, they just put me at. Um, well, we just had a crack wherever. Yeah. Just wanted that. I, um, I pretty much played the whole back line, even <laughs> though I wasn't a fast person. I don't know why they put me on the wing. I wasn't that quick. <laughs> back myself though, but but um, obviously with my background, I tried to see if I could go into the midfield, try hit it up a bit more. Yeah. Uh, wasn't as big and strong as bloody uh, some of the boys, so they just put me in a bit closer. And I've just been playing nine and ten since, mostly ten. Yeah, when did you start really honing in on your craft as a nine, as a halfback? Uh probably when I left left school. Oh, really? This academy eighteen sort of year. Or just playing playing club really. Oh yeah. I played I played club for um, Harrow Boys Marist, and um, they were premier team. At, uh, they were a premier team or club at the time. But um, the goal was to try and help elevate them into the Premier um, League in, in Wellington. Oh, yeah. And um, I still remember, like, even with some of the old boys on the team, I was that confident that I wanted to play every position. I played second five eight in a couple <laughs> oh, in one game. And the, and the coach after goes, yeah, no, nah, we'll stick to putting you at 10 or 9, eh? <laughs> But um, yeah, I spent most of my time at at, at nine and ten. What did you prefer? Ten, because I don't want to dig dig in a, <laughs> into a ruck and pass the ball. You get pulled back into it sometimes with bloody rucks. <laughs> so you wanted to play league, and then you wanted to play ten, but you somehow end up being a um, all black nine. <laughs> yeah, probably wasn't the fastest either. <laughs> bloody or the tallest bloody Jimmy. Jimmy was bloody huge. <laughs> Standing next to him, all Dong is like up here, and I'm like way down here. And I'm like, bro, can you like lose some some of your height so I don't look so bloody short? 
And then what was it like going into the Wellington setup? Because how old were you when you had your first, um, you were first named in the Wellington Lions? Twenty. Man, so it all happened pretty fast, eh? So I was 19, 19 turning, turning 20. So a year, year and a half sort of set up of playing nine, going to these academy sessions, and you're in there. Which was a stacked Wellington team too at the time too. Oh, yeah, I was a scrap for that. Cully was on the team, Spiny, Bobby Fartal. Jonah had made a few appearances. I know, you know, obviously the big guy was sick. Um, but, you know, just to have him... yeah. Um, and the team was like, I oh, was just, just because you watch some of the clips of him and what he's done, and just put the game on the on the map, you know. Yeah. Um, just to have him there training, and it yeah, was mean. It was mean just to rub shoulders with him. <clears throat> but yeah, it was a pretty, pretty stacked team. I remember my I was actually talked about this last night. I was at a um. At a speaking engagement and with the gun boots on, uh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it was civil contractor, so I felt right. I was at home, <laughs> but um, I was just telling them, you know, the we played against Southland. That was my, I was my first game for Wellington Lions, and um, I was nervous. And Namir was in the team as well, so the both of us were being nervous, as you know, young, nervous. So we we actually rung our mates and went to town. Went down to Courtney Place to go to time zone. Yeah. We spent a good two, maybe three hours just playing freaking laser tag, you know, <laughs> playing games and things like that. And um, we went back to the hotel and basically we didn't even um, feel nervous after that. It was like, it was almost like a, uh, a relaxation sort of sort of thing just to get everything off us off our, all the nerves yeah. out, of, out of our out of our system and it happened we did that quite a few times in our first year um and yeah looking back now was i remember when i mentioned that last night daryl looked at me like oh, did you go out and tell <laughs> said, no 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 i didn't go out I, w- I went out with my mates to go ties up time zone so i can bloody go and play Species. <laughs> <laughs> did you do that throughout your career, like before the World Cup or anything like that, when you were nervous? Did you nah. head back to your, your roots of time zone? Everything changed. We started pl- having card games now. Oh, yeah. yeah. You know, stop the bus. Um, I think kids call it three up, three down these days. Presidents and, uh, you know, assholes. <laughs> 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 All those games. And, like, I remember... Um, you know, it started off with just a, a few of us, and then it just started getting bigger and better, uh, bigger. And then the boys started getting real competitive. Mm. So it got to the stage where we had, if there was six of us playing, and there was, we'd always there'd always be a waiting list. Boys would be just sitting there waiting to get in. <laughs> so as soon as you got knocked out and whatever it was, you're out. Next person's in, <laughs> <laughs> and you're just sitting there waiting, like, oh, hurry up, man! Speed these games up so I can have a chance to come back in. <laughs> so yeah, it went from bloody spaces to um, to yeah. cards. Oh, how good! And even like when you'd made Wellington, did you did you love Union at this stage, or you're still like wishing to be a league player? Um. I was still wanted to be a league player, but I, I was um, grateful that, you know, I had um, worked hard enough to sort of uh, get a foot in the door. Yeah. And then from there, I just had to learn, obviously, you know, she's a bit different uh, when you're just a kid. Raw is just out there. Sometimes you just don't care, just want to have a crack. Dummy, yeah. try and run through someone get smashed backwards and you just keep trying until you actually get through. So um, it was, I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed my first season. Um, you know, I had the likes of Spicy um, to, to learn off um, in, in terms of, uh, you know, I guess understanding the ins and outs of, of a nine um, and, and le- learning my craft through, through him. But not only that, like oh, at club, you know, had guys that um, that helped me out, um, and that I could rely on or lean on if I if I needed a hand or something out on the field, mm-hmm. um, and yeah, from I guess after the end of the O three uh, Wellington 
or the um, NPC comp, I actually got named, which was a shock. I didn't think I was good enough to actually be named in the Hurricane squad uh, in 2004. So, yeah, it was... I'd, to be fair, I thought I didn't think I'd done enough to, to be, um, you know, considered to be selected in that squad. And uh, and I didn't even think I'd I, um, done enough to, to be a, a part of the, the whole campaign. Right, but you obviously had... Because you, you were playing that first year pretty much straight away from memory, weren't you? Pretty much. Goal kicking and everything. Ah, oh, a little bit, not 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 yeah. so much. Like um, <clears throat> the the beauty of it all is like I I spent some time with Ricky Flutie. He was a senior when I was at TA. Ricky Flutie. Oh, true. Okay. So <laughs> I used to have to be his ball boy. He used to practice his kicks during the week, <laughs> and he must have known. Oh, oh, this little punk will know how to kick. So he was kicking goals, and I had to bloody kick them back to him and stuff like that. So. It was um good ha- having uh flutes like a as as a senior, you know, looked up to him at, at um at school. Uh, he made you know, New Zealand schools and, and and all that at the time, and you know just to have him at at the Canes as well, um you know just made made things a lot easier for me to sort of try and help myself out and get into the team and um see what I can do to or what I can learn. From uh, yeah. the old heads, and we'll obviously learn a bit more about structures and game plans, and trying yeah. to stick to it, not try and do your own thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, was it an intimidating team to go into? Obviously, heaps of legends, um, some quite intimidating faces as well. Um, no, it was actually quite an, uh, inviting. Yeah, they might look ugly and scary on the TV <laughs> and on the on the field, but like. You know, they actually sort of, it's, it, it was the same when I made the, the All Blacks. Yeah. You know, it felt like I had been in the team for like a couple of years already. Mm. Um, you know, the hardest part, it wasn't so much meeting the boys and all the legends and, you know, fan fanboying at, at some of them. It was more, <laughs> as soon as you met your teammates, you had to go and do your testing. <laughs> so obviously back then it was the old uh, 3k time trials oh. phosphate decrement sprint oh man I'd never done all that kind of stuff before yeah you know wasn't wasn't one of my uh, favourite bloody <laughs> tests to do and then uh, I remember trying to like we did uh, bench press squats and all that chin ups and then I could have hardly pull myself up on the chin, uh, on the chin rack, and bloody, start making us push, uh, push uh, sixty kilos on the bench, and I couldn't even push that. <laughs> By the time I had like uh, finished my career, I was actually I was happy because I doubled my bloody bench. I was <laughs> benching a hundred and twenty, so I was happy that I actually uh, got better at that. <laughs> so this is when you hur- join the Hurricanes. That's your testing. Yeah, the, it was the three k, and then after that we had to do like uh, the phosphate decrement, which is like uh, forty meter sprints, and it's ten and yeah. all timed. And then you've got like you walk. I think you walk five meters, come back five meters, and then they count down. And you've just got to like try and stick to the same timing every time. But yeah, honestly, you look like you absolutely loved it. Yeah. I I loved it, all right. <laughs> <laughs> they did have a pretty tough year from memory that first year you were in there, but they did get better each year over the next following years up into the sort of fog final. Um, I know you're a big part of that game. What do you remember about that one? Uh, it was actually foggy. I actually got knocked out in that game. Oh, did you? Yeah, I actually put my head in the wrong place. I copped the knee from uh, Kevin Senior. I went to try and make a tackle on him, got need, was out cold. Um, I'm sure, I I think if you look back on the footage, you can just sort of make <laughs> make out that someone's lying on the ground. Um, and I tried to, I slowly come, well, I wouldn't say I came to, but got up, got checked, carried on. And then I missed the tackle against um, Casey Laulala. Oh. Um 
even when I'm not foggy, I probably would have missed that tackle too. But um, I didn't actually know what was happening until about one o'clock in the morning. The next day, I was out. I was out with the team, and my older brother was there with me, keeping an eye on me. But um, yeah, we were out, and I, I actually was like looking around, going, "Hey, was the game finished?" So, yeah, mate, we're it's one o'clock in the morning. I was like, "No, no, bro, we got to go." Home. Far out. So I ended up, I ended up going back to the hotel, and uh, basically, yeah, just went straight to sleep because I didn't know what the hell was going on. And I just wanted to make sure that everything was sweet when I woke up uh, earlier on that morning. Man, that is crazy. The boys asked, oh, do you remember the penalty kick that you did? I was like, what penalty? <laughs> <laughs> and you did you play the whole game like that? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. I played the whole game like that. I suppose no one could see that you were you were struggling. Nah, <laughs> bloody the, our team doctor and physio were both on the sideline, the opposite sideline where, where I got knocked out. Oh, they wouldn't have seen so they didn't anything. See it. The coaches wouldn't yeah. have seen it. No. <laughs> Can never find the footage. You're just out there absolutely battling. Pretty much. <laughs> An autopilot. And that was before the sort of concussion protocols and all that had come in. Eh? It was it was still pretty old school back then. You shake them off and you get back into it. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, oh, I'm just grateful that um, that was the last game. So I wasn't trying to back up the week after. Yeah. Um, and try and figure out what the bloody hell happened the week before. Far out. Would, would you have um, stayed out there now, knowing what you know now? Um, I probably would. Yeah. Just because, you know, we, none of us ever want to go off the field unless we've got a broken leg. Mm. Like, you got to drag us off the field in, in order to get us off. And I think, I'm not saying that's the attitude to have, but back then... You never really. You just wanted to be on the field to go to war week in week out, and when when that number come up on the sideline and your and it showed your number, you obviously you would have been pissed off and stuff like that. But yeah. you know, I know with the protocols, I understand that as a coach now um, that you know you've got to take care of of um, your players, um, whereas obviously you know they're, they're thoroughly checking. Um, boys, even ones that have taken a head knock, but you know, are absolutely fine. Yeah. But you know, just to make sure that they haven't had like a delayed concussion of some sort or anything like that. But yeah, I'd, if I now, if I was still running around, I'd, I'd still be trying to run, uh, stay out there as much as possible. Yeah, and you obviously can't remember the game, but do you remember like walking out there that day or like the whole fog situation? <laughs> Playing in well, it. I remember going to the game uh, on the on the bus and how how foggy it was. I'm like, surely, surely we're not playing in this. <laughs> surely it's going to lift. But all I remember was the national anthems. Yeah, our national anthem, and that was it. Yeah, done. And so, but I do remember sort of leading up to the game uh, and to the national anthem. Um, after that, everything's a blur. Mm, mate, I was in the stands that day. I remember driving down from Nelson to come watch the Mighty Canes get their first ever victory. Couldn't see a thing. Absolutely gutted. <laughs> oh, exactly. The, be- the worst part is you try and do a box kick. The boys are chasing it, but how are they going to see the- where the ball's coming? <laughs> Even lady, I was talking to Rico because Rico was uh, on the on the wing. He goes, "Cause I had no idea where their ball was coming from." <laughs> you just had to wait for the sun. As soon as you heard the sun, oh, that's in the pretty close. <laughs> It's one of those games that eh, you'll always remember, or you won't always remember, but everyone will remember the whole situation because it's just one of those things where it was like so crazy, so bizarre. Oh, hard out. Like, I think for us, um, we wish that we probably could have um, sort of, you know, continued to, or like postpone the game and play another day. Yeah. Just so that we could actually Keep see what we're doing and have a proper crack at you know, the opposition that way. Yeah, you were flying that year too, eh? It wasn't too bad. Mm. <laughs> and then obviously the following year, 2007, Rugby World Cup rolls around. Um, you were in the All Blacks at the time, but you miss out on uh, World Cup selection. What, what what was that like to deal with? Oh, it was tough because as soon as you get told, it's like they're pushing you out the door to get the hell out of there. True. So, so that the boys, can, the, the next boys 
can come in without you know it being awkward mm. there's also the letter of us like the backboners or the dds that week Thursday nights is usually, you know, the night for the DDs where we get to go out mm. and just, you know, have our night out. And so obviously there was all this bloody rubbish around, letters being given to um, put on the Ted's bloody door about me and a few of the other boys being out uh, and all that um, two nights before a bloody uh, a test. And so when that all started coming out after, I was like, you can't get onto our floor. The only ones that can get onto our floor are people that are actually staying at the hotel and they've got to be having, I mean, they've got to have a key to get access to our floor. So clearly you guys are talking yarns. Yeah. So it kind of, you know, it kind of um, was a tough pill to swallow. Um, I remember once I got told, pack my bag as quick as I could, um, jumped in the vehicle that, uh, that took us to the airport. Just as we did that, the other man showed up and I realized who, who they picked over me. So Andy jumped out of the van and walked in and I was just like, oh, okay. So you went with him. Yeah. All good. True. So there's no conversation or anything about what was happening. You were just told you're gone. Oh, pack your pretty much. They tried to... They tried to uh, sugarcoat it, but the way I saw it was, all right, sweet. You don't fucking want me. All good. Yeah. Um, and then after that, I went home um, and tried to figure out whether I hang around or if I go to Aussie and try and have a crack at my dream. True. Was that legit? You went back um, looking at league clubs? Oh, no, I didn't look at league clubs, but I, I knew in my head, okay, these guys don't want this waste of time me staying around. If I'm mm. not gonna, if I didn't get looked in right now to play in this World Cup, then clearly I I don't need to be here. Um, and so all I needed to do was just finish because we still had NPC. So all I needed to do was finish my campaign with NPC. Um, once that's done, then I was gonna I was keen to try and um, see go and see some clubs over in Aussie. How close did you get? Oh, I ended up, my agent told me that I had about three offers on the table. Um, but I had a, I had a yarn to my older brother, um, Billy, and um, he said to me that I wasn't allowed to go. Like he said to me, no, nah, you've got a, you've got a job to do here. You've got a point to prove. Yeah, it might take four years. It's going to be four years of hard work. You're going to be in and out, but you've got a point to prove just to shut them, shut them up. Um, and so I didn't end up oh, so good because like <laughs> had the two contracts there, and it, like to me it wasn't like so much about the the money; it was more the dream, like what you loved, yeah, yeah. And yeah. so for that to be sitting, you know, all I had to do was say yeah, sign, and then my brother's like, no, nah, you're going nowhere. You gotta, right. You've got four years to work to get this right. It's crazy, crazy how close everything was. Eh? Sliding doors, what, where you'd be now, and how all your life would be um, if you did just say yes. What, what clubs were they? Uh, the wires? Nah, the, <laughs> the Warriors went, went on the table. Uh, I think it was the Titans and the Bulldogs. Oh, true. I've always, I've been a Broncos fan since they thought, I reckon if they had to put one in front of me, I probably would have signed it straight away. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Man, that's crazy. But then obviously uh, your brother's words of wisdom did work out because four years later you are named in the um, Rugby World Cup squad. What was it like? Because you'd come off a pretty rough year with the Hurricanes too that year too. Well, because we had... Um, I was still coming back from a, a broken leg. I broke my leg in uh, NPC. Oh, that's right. That was a nasty one too. Yeah, eh? I had a fracture dislocation. The old oh. ankle's out this way. Oh, I I think, you know, the best part was that the strap, I think the strapping tape saved me uh, a longer recovery. Oh, yeah. Like in terms of like, um, you know, if, if my ankle wasn't strapped, I reckon it would have been a lot longer in terms of the recovery side of it. Come off. Um, so 
it was a it was it was definitely a struggle for me and you know coming off that and then starting training i mean i'm i'm going to the gym by myself um at stupid o'clock just to not be anywhere near the team yeah. but still to get my job uh, get my my training in um and oh man i'm not gonna lie i was in some dark places during during that time just because I hate doing the same stuff over and over. Mm. Like it felt like all the trainings I was doing was very repetitive. Um, and I tried to explain it to my trainers, and I was just swearing at them the whole time. Like I was, uh, yeah, I was probably not the best best guy yeah. to be be training at that time. But um, my brother started coming along, helping me out, pushing me through it. Um, not so much on the training side of it. He'll be sitting there acting like he's on a machine trying to do cardio but really he's looking at me like hurry up mate <laughs> push the bloody uh the bloody uh bar so that we can uh keep up with this bloody recovery side of things so yeah that was that was a tough period in time for me like not being able to be doing preseason with the boys mm-hmm. out on the field with the boys um and so the day that i actually got to run around um on the field uh, it was like one of my happiest days because I was I was getting closer and closer to joining the team again. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was a it was a massive battle in my head uh, through those periods of times, and then when I finally started playing rugby, my biggest thing was whether I was confident enough that it wouldn't break again. Mm. You know, flashbacks of what happened. Well, true. We're getting those flashbacks. Yeah, so you know, someone will tackle me and I quickly jump just to try not to yeah, get okay. caught again and right. stuff like that. But you know, it took me a while. I think um, that whole process helped me realize that you know, um, when you're when you've got a, a injury that's kept you out of the game for so long, mm. you know, you've actually got to make sure that you look after yourself properly. Yeah. You know, I mean, not not in the sense of like eating, but like in the sense of like actually doing rehab, actually stretching, um, doing some mobility around around the injury so that you know it's not stiffening up and that you still got that flexibility that you had beforehand. Mm. Um, just little things like that. So you know, trying to move forward, get myself into a condition where I'm still. Um, able to play footy i'm not not quite at my playing weight but just still you know having that process to get me to where i need to be by end of like tri nations yeah um that was that was the process that we had put in place with the the all blacks coaches uh and the trainers both the hurricanes and also um gilly um you know that that helped so much in terms of you know, okay, if I actually make sure that I, I spend spend time uh, and stick to it, that I actually, you know, um, there to support me and they're giving me the confidence that I need that, you know, if you get yourself in a good condition and you can start playing super rugby, you know, there's an opportunity there for you. Mm. But, you know, you can't just sit back and wait you know, and think that it's, just going to be there you've still got to fight to, to earn that that opportunity to be in the team again yeah did you think you could do it obviously what you'd been through with weren't picked and then going through this the mental struggles and training by yourself it's so isolating did you did you feel like you're going to be able to get back to the bet your best and um, be available oh i just knew I, I would definitely be available yeah like i i just from conversations with uh the three wise men mm. you know they gave me I wouldn't say reassurance, but they gave me an, enough to make me feel like, yes, if I actually put um, my head down and my ass up and go to work, that that spot that I've, I've been fighting for is potentially there. Mm. But if you don't work for it, it's not going to be there and we're just you know, not going to bother with it. But um, yeah, I, I guess the, the biggest part was trying to get on the field first and foremost. Mm. Yeah. Um, I managed to get back to play um, a few games for, for Wainui. 
um, that's where I was getting a bit scared, you know. I mean, it was wet too, and uh, you just thinking, oh, someone's actually going to slide underneath <laughs> me. It's going to happen again, and my yeah. dream of, you know, playing in the World Cup is going to be taken away from me once again. But, um, yeah, I, was, I slowly got a bit more confident with it, and then managed to come back, play uh, against the force, Western force up in Palmy. And um, the lungs were freaking screaming. <laughs> wasn't so much the rest of the body, but the lungs were screaming like, what are you up to, cuz? <laughs> so um, it was, yeah, it was awesome just to finally be able to um, get back on the field, uh, you know, and start playing footy with the boys again. Mm. Um, but yeah, it was it was definitely tough. Like I, I battled through some demons. Yeah. To uh to get there. But you got there and how'd you find out? How'd you find out you were going to the two thousand M Rugby World Cup? Oh well, because they had obviously the Steinlager series, um, before Tri Nations. And then uh obviously had the Tri Nations, but because it was such a big year and we had um the earthquake down in uh, Christchurch. Right. So majority of the team um that was involved in the Tri Nations uh, we played. They played the games here in New Zealand, so all the Canary boys played um, those games. But we left to go to South Africa, um, and pretty much all the all the Canterbury boys um, stayed home to be with their families. Oh yeah. Um, and so we went up there. I wouldn't say with a under strength team, but it wasn't our full full team. But we still felt that we could do the job. Um, so we went there, um, played South Africa, lost to South Africa, and they actually named the squad we were in South Africa. Oh, yeah. So all the players knew, before everyone else knew, um, when uh, when they announced the team. But the distinct part about it was we had to go to Brisbane after that. Everyone? Everyone. Oh, true. So these guys knew, and they still had to play a game. The boys that didn't make the squad had to travel to um, Australia, to Brisbane, and, um, you know, basically they had no chance to go home and be with Fano mm. um, to, to support them and be there for them, you know, through that period of time. Mm. So a few of us decided, you know, they've got no family here. We're family. To, we feel like we're family to them, so we need to be around, be around them, um, to make sure that they, you know, they know that we're here for you, bro. I know it's a, mm-hmm. it's a sad time, um, and so we lost in Brisbane, um, and you know, for all of us, we well, it's the first time I actually seen Ted throw his toys, bro. <laughs> but especially in the change rooms, I've never seen him throw his toys that that bad before. Um, but the way I've seen it is those two losses that we did, that we that we had in the Tri Nations, uh, Tri Nations actually set us up for uh, the World Cup because we understood that there's uh, three areas that we need to take care of um, to help us. Uh, have a successful campaign. Mm. Obviously, one of them was the mental side of it. That was a huge one. We spent more time focusing on our mental side of the game. Mm. Um, the other one is momentum shifts, when the momentum shifts are on, on the opposition side, and how do we get that back? Um, and then, obviously, with 2007, they had no one taking a shot at the old uh, drop kick. Yeah. Um, you know, we actually set ourselves up um, so that that was up our, our sleeve whenever we needed to pull it out. Um, so leading into the World Cup, I was confident that we were going to win because I felt that we have focused on three areas that we needed to, and we basically just tried to nail it week in, week out with those those three things. Right. That's, that's positive news for all, all Blacks fans heading into this World Cup too. That, I, I forgot that you guys had lost two games going into that World Cup. I just remember you guys being red-hot favourites to win it. Yeah, well, to us, we we obviously, you know, being at home, 
Yeah. Um, you know, you want to make sure that you get the job done. But I felt we we worked hard uh, in those three areas to allow us to, to get to the big dance. And if we needed to, like, set ourselves up to go go for the win, we we done the, everything possible to, to give us that chance mm. um, if we needed to. But, um, yeah, that was huge learnings for us. That's what I felt anyway. Not only that, those three things, yeah, we we done a lot of other things um, leading up to trainings. We had many, many group chats, so all the nines and tens would get together. Yeah. And the, the best things that we talked about were the what ifs. What if we're losing? What do we do? And, yeah. like, all of us would have our, our input. Most of it was just... Yeah, what he said. But <laughs> then you try and throw a little, a little uh, ripple in the uh, in the system, and then the boys look at you. Hey, when did we talk about that? Oh, oh no, oh no, maybe not this week, maybe next week. But um, it's the what ifs that that helped us understand that, like, if someone or in the team that's important goes down, what do we do next? And mm-hmm. obviously, with DC. DC done yeah. his uh, hip flexor and training before Canada. Um, you know, we didn't actually panic. Yeah. We knew exactly what we needed to do because we talked about it. We, and, um, you know, that made us understand that, like, okay, he's gone down. Oh, you're going in. You're doing the same role. You know, whatever you need you need uh, help with, we got your back. Um, if he's not if he's not doing something, we'll talk to him about it. I need you to play a bit more down here. Yeah. Um, how how many tens deep was it till you um, started to think? Okay, <laughs> we're getting low here. Or oh, putting your hand up. I know you love playing ten. No, I think um, it didn't matter how many we we had. We we felt that Could like have gone um, to the well, yeah. Yeah, we, I think you know with Aaron coming in, him getting injured, Beaver coming in. You know, um, we basically told Beaver that week, even the same with Crud when he was there. Aaron, we said, "Look, you just play footy. We got you. Mm. You just, we just want you to, you know, if you need to put us in the right end of the field, you know, these are the cons so that everyone's on the same page. Um, but we just want you to go out there and play footy, and we can run the team if you want. But if you want to run this team with us, let's go. And so it didn't matter who we had." I think we had a we done the homework and we put on all the hours we needed to 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 execute a game plan to win. Um, whether we were seven points down, twelve points down, we still knew that we could execute the game plan if we really needed to. Um, we probably shouldn't have, you know, gave everyone a heart attack and finished with eight seven <laughs> in the final, but. Um, I think for us, you know, it wasn't just a relief. It was more the fact that, you know, we we practiced everything that we wanted to to execute. Obviously, we seen it in the in the uh, Australian in our game in the semi where Aaron Cruden did the dropping. You know, yeah. We talked about getting that whenever we needed that, and we could have executed that in the final at some stage. Um, but not only that, leading into um, Argentina, those momentum shifts, we understood, like, you know, we need to make sure that we're in control. If we start losing control, and there's, a, like, a, a flow-on effect where we're losing the momentum, it's a drop ball, penalty, lose a line out, lose a scrum, mm. you know, we need to go back to basics and figure out, okay, this is what we've got to do now. Everyone yeah. needs to calm down, get ourselves back into the now, execute this, finish with that, so we had a lot of processes um, mapped out before we even got to to World Cup, which helped us immensely to mm. to get the job done. Yeah, and you obviously did. And how do you feel about the whole movement of keep calm, pities on? Obviously, started after the seven from seven um, penalties against Argentina in the quarterfinal, where obviously Carter had gone down. Needed a kicker to step up. You step up. How were you feeling going into that game, being a goal kicker with literally the country on your shoulder? Oh, so I, I don't know. I'm probably a bit different to, to Slady and also to Dizzy. Um, you know, 
with kicking, you either get it or you don't. <laughs> and if you don't, oh, shit happens. You just got to get on with it and play footy. Yeah. Um, I guess I was just lucky that, you know, uh, the practice that I had done, which was none during the week. Like, I <laughs> <laughs> I don't pra- I never practice my kicks because I, I learned through um, Mick Byrne yeah. that if the ball fly, flies in a certain way, um, that's not my natural flight, then I've done something um, wrong in it mm. and I need to figure out what it is. So I figured out what a perfect perfect kick looked like for me and felt like. And then anything after that, if it didn't feel like that, it, I done, I had done something wrong. So um, come quarter final time, I didn't practice kicking, kicking that week. I only practiced on, in the warm-up. That's crazy. Like I did my warm-up. Um, practice my kicks and just all I was looking for was just if I was on the right hand side how the ball was flying yeah um, and if, the, if there was any wind there you know how hard I was pushing it across the, the post yeah go to the left hand side get a feel of the exact same thing sort of a little bit to the sides and see what you know what I've got to do as long as I'm sticking to my process and just kicking through rather because I know sometimes when it's an easy kick you know, some kickers just actually think, oh, yeah, I just tapped this over. Yeah, yeah. But if you don't follow through with your whole process, you know, it's, um, it can actually jeopardize the flight of everything. Yeah. So just trying to get a feel of it. And then when I'm like, I did maybe one or two on the, on the 40, just to see, you know, the further out, if it flies differently, um, when I'm trying to kick through it. Um, but yeah, that's, that's all down to, to Mick Byrne about, you know, teaching us the mechanic, well, teaching me the mechanics of kicking, whether it's box kicking, um, kicking out of the hand, um, place kicking, drop kicks, you know, learning everything through him, who's an ex-AFL player. Yeah. You know, some of the skills that he, he taught us, I'm thinking, are you sure you didn't play league or rugby cunts? Because, like, <laughs> I don't think I've seen any of these bloody uh, drills or these skills by anyone else. Yeah. And you're an AF, AFL player. So, you know, this is, like, to me, I was mind long that someone, a legend of the AFL, comes and he's a kicking coach for us. But not only that, he's, like, teaching us all about, like, punching the ball, you know, rather than trying to reload and things like that. So yeah. all the all the mechanics of, like, kicking through Mick, you know, I, I wouldn't say I didn't have to practice. But like, yeah. if anything, I needed to keep practicing was around my general play kick, box kicking. Mm. But goal kicking, I didn't need to practice that because through Mick, I, I pretty much understood. Mate, you make it sound so easy. Oh, it, it is once you understand. Mm. Like, it's, yeah, it's it's bizarre. I mean, I've, I've watched Jimmy golf a few times at Rugby League Park and, you know, Jimmy's a great kicker and just the battles he was having with himself yeah you know just swearing at the ball like or the goalpost and i'm like <laughs> pretty sure that i've been stuck there the whole time my bro and it's the it's me looking for my father and bro um why are you getting angry at that like yeah you shouldn't be practicing because you come to game day and you start and you're kicking exactly how you were at training mm. that's just going to eat into your uh, mindset or your uh, thing, oh, oh my god, I missed that one. Why did I miss that one? Oh my yeah. gosh, I need to move on. But you know, yeah. and so I used to, that, that watching him do that a few times, I used to, I'm just like, you know what, nah, I need to come up with something because I don't want to have that <laughs> where I'm thinking too much about kicking you know, a ball between two two bloody sticks. Yeah, you obviously passed it on to him though. He's one of the most successful kickers in the Premiership history. Oh, nah, Jimmy's bloody. He's always been pretty hard out when it comes to like kicking in general. Yeah, he put a lot of time into it. So, but um, yeah, he's forty this year. Yeah, still going strong. Yeah, and still running around in in, uh, in front. Yeah, incredible, eh? Living the yeah. dream. <laughs> oh, I'm surprised he hasn't uh, pulled out the old golf clubs yet. Oh, actually, I think he might have seen him pull it out. Sure. Bit cold over there to do surfing, though. <laughs> yeah. Especially in the winter, yeah, for sure. Well, what a what a um, World Cup, and um, obviously once you'd won it, the final um, Beavers kick. I think 
Why weren't you kicking that? You'd missed a couple that game and came off injured as well. I um, strained my groin in the warm-up. Oh, did you? Yeah. Oh, I actually... Wow. Uh, Another one. What was with the groins? Was this kicking? Well, after the quarterfinal, um, I actually done extra practice. Like oh. I had gone to... But the... The, Going against the what you've just told uh, us. <laughs> nah, yeah, I know, but there's a reason why, though. Like, Smithy gave me this look of like, well, you better be taking this bloody serious or I'm going to freaking leave you on the bench and I'll get someone else to do this that may take this seriously. But, um, like, yeah, I was, he gave me, as soon as he gave me the look, I knew that look straight away. I was like, oh, man. Yeah. Just let me do my thing. Like, don't, put pressure on me to practice um and so i done a kicking session the day before the semi-final um and shanked a few um kicked a few and then did the same thing the week after um i knew it was a bit tight but just thought you know we'll get through the week got to captain's run he's giving me the look again i'm like you, you really want me to so I practiced um, at captain's run and then started warming up in the final and going through my routine and um, I think I might have been only about kick number four in my uh, in my kicking routine and I just looked at Mick and was like bro something's not feeling right here because I kept pulling it to the left, it's because I couldn't, I wasn't feeling comfortable in my follow through. Sure. Um, and so I basically told the physios, we went inside, I don't know what the hell they were going to do to try and save me to play. <laughs> um, but yeah, I um, I tweaked my groin, and um, every the two kicks that I like, Woody's try and the penalty that I missed, both times I was trying to figure out, you know, just kick through. Bite down on their gumshield son and freaking hope for the best. <laughs> but just as you go to approach, you know, that backswing and then the yeah. follow coming through, you felt it as soon as you bloody planted your foot. You're like, oh, this isn't going to be nice. Yeah. So you just pull out just because you don't want to yeah. pull it like how bloody right easy on. and uh, Slady, Slady did it. So that's the reason why I didn't kick so well in that final. And um, even at half time, I ran to Mick and said, nah. Beaver needs to kick, bro. Like, um, I can hardly freaking kick. Yeah. Let alone run around. Um, oh, so that's crazy. So, um, we got together, and we, him and I, basically said to Beaver, "Look, you've got to kick, bro. You all goods to kick goals." And Beaver went, "Yeah, all goods." Um, yeah. and so yeah, Beaver stepped up and slotted. It. Now there's a movie on him. He actually, uh, <laughs> when he kicked it, I knew it went straight between the sticks, but um. Richie was telling him that he thought he missed it. <laughs> <laughs> and Beaver was confident. Was, nah, nah, he bro. Turned he, was, he turned early. He turned early. He was play. confident. <laughs> he and then I remember, like running back, I remember running back to him. I'm like looking at Beaver like, bro, I saw your juicy out, kiss. Um, <laughs> <laughs> pulling it down all the time. <laughs> oh, so good, eh? So good memories of the World Cup. One thing I do want to talk to you about, though, is your obviously your Hurricanes time. It was, I think, it was the same year, two thousand eleven. Um, you leave the Hurricanes. Keen to hear around the conversations around that because obviously Hurricane legend. Um, what happened there? Uh, oh, do I? We had our uh, obviously new coach, um, and. Um, obviously all the all the leaders uh, on themselves had massive influence on it but like you were in the leadership group kind of but not sort of hard out like <laughs> Hori and, and Co but because um, I'd obviously been there since 04 and yeah and I've obviously been been around for quite some time um, yeah got together with uh, the head coach and, you know, just basically said, look, don't try and turn this into the Crusaders because we're not. Mm. You know, bring some of the, some like, keep the fear that we've got 
but you know there there definitely is some areas that we need to work on mm. and if you could bring that um and give us the edge around it i think you know everything should be sweet but so obviously you know it's a little bit like uh Uncle Jamie Joe, his way or the highway type type old school mentality. Yeah. Um and yeah, sort of a few boys butted heads with him because, you know, all we're trying to do is continue with what what we've been been um doing, but we understood the areas that needed to change mm-hmm. and to try and turn us into a team that we're not. Um rather than just working with the, the cattle that you've got and understanding the cattle that you've got um, and, and nurturing that and trying to make it uh, a little bit better, give it a bit more edge to it uh, and make sure that you understand the areas that, have, that um, aren't so great within the team structure. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, was, it was a tough one. All my mates, all, all the senior boys were pretty much getting pushed out. Um, and I had a chance to sort of stay or go. Um, and I read an article, him saying that uh, I left for to go to the Blues because of the money. But I was getting, I got offered more to stay at the Hurricane. Oh, really? It had nothing to do with, with money. Mine was more environment and, yeah. and in terms of like, you know, creating, keeping the same sort of... Um, culture that we've had um, but not try and change it too much you know still want to keep that that structure that we've always had as, as the hurricanes they all um, predict the un- unpredictable I think it is or something like yeah, that yeah, yeah. you know try and continue to keep that but still have um, something that other teams uh, haven't seen us do which is obviously the biggest one was the breakdown mm. being absolute menaces in the break that's what the Crusaders have have been um, dominant over the years is all that ugly hard work that those boys, you know, don't, especially that pack. Mm. No matter what pack they had, they had a pack that would always, guys knew what their roles were. If your role was to hit rucks, you hit rucks. And you're, you're, the, you're a beast at hit, hitting rucks, you know. Um, we probably lacked a little bit and just relied on a couple of boys to do those, those roles when, in fact, everyone needed to roll the old sleeves up and, and go to mahi. But, um, yeah, it had nothing to do with money. Mine was more um, culture. And the way that I, I saw it wasn't, wasn't quite the culture that I wanted to be involved with because it, yeah. it, it was changing dramatically. Um, so, yeah, that's why I decided to um, move away and, and, and go to, to Auckland. Um, and... I, it was a tough one because you know I didn't really want to leave. Mm, like, all I yeah, wanted to do was just say, yeah. "Yeah." Was there pressure from some of the boys to get you to stay? Were they? Were some of them saying, "Come, nah, please, like stay"? And some obviously oh. who had left. Was there pressure on them for you to leave as well? Like we sort of stuck in the middle a little bit. Uh, no, I wouldn't say I was stuck in the middle. I, I think like Bodie rang me out yeah. of the blue too, and I was like, "Hey, whose number's this?" Because you know, <laughs> obviously. I don't know that the young fellow, yeah, yeah, I don't know the young fellow was, you know, coming down and I was just like, oh, yeah, 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 um, I'm going to think about this one, uh, bro, but, you know, obviously the likes of TJ was coming through mm. um, in, in terms of, uh, you know, wanting to um, continue uh, being a dominant force that he has been, um, you know, had uh, JGP, who's now with... Uh, with Ireland, Jefferson Gibson yeah. Park, you know, yeah. he was nipping at my heels. Um, and so I thought, you know, what I'll be keen to try a, a different culture and, and see what we can, what I can achieve with, with it. Wasn't the greatest in 2010, uh, 12, sorry, yeah. but um, definitely some, some big improvements after that from uh, moving forward in, in 2013. And that, so, yeah, the biggest reason was I could see that the the culture and the way that they were moving wasn't quite uh, the one that I was thinking it would be. So I thought I'd, you know, have a bit of a change and see what it was like. 
Yeah, and how'd you find the culture up there in Auckland? Different. <laughs> oh, yeah, the big fucking lights of Auckland, the big smoke. Um, we, we, bro, we had a coffee machine and a barista. But I'm like, oh, this is the next level just to have a coffee at your bloody uh, at Mahi. Just go to the cafe and get one cup. Um, but yeah, just, just uh, things like that. But other than that, like, um, learning my, uh, who my new teammates are, even though we played against them, yeah, played side by side with some of them. Um, and I just seen it as an opportunity to, just to try and start fresh. Mm. Um, it wasn't easy though. Like obviously every season, everyone's slagging me around the media, around my weight and stuff like that. So end of 2011, um, I almost lost my father. And so rather than me training, I was at the hospital. We were sleeping on the floor mm. just so that we could be next to dad who was in ICU. And um, like a, I got, I come close to not going to Auckland because I wanted to be there for my dad. Yeah. Um, just in case, you know, if anything happened, I was there. Um, and so definitely was had no desire to train. Um, all I wanted to do was just yeah, be there. So I just sat there waiting. Mm. Sometimes we weren't doing anything. We just sat there waiting. Um, helping out the nurses and stuff like that to, to help roll our dad to um, basically, you know, tidy him up and make sure he's nice and fresh so um, that he's not sort of like, I think they get, because they're uh, in the comas and stuff like that, sometimes they get um, sores and things like that. Yeah. So we tried to make sure that we helped him out because he wasn't, wasn't the skinniest man to to um, bloody lift as a, as a nurse. So <laughs> our family was always there trying to help out where we could. Mm. Um, and uh, so when I did finally leave and move to Auckland, you know, I wasn't uh, in great nick, but um, I always knew that like, if there's a if there's a goal that you want me to get to, I'll bust my ass to get get to it. Yeah. So there was always a um, a big goal, a medium goal, and a little goal when it comes to trying to drop the weight. Um, just so I could be running around with the boys. Mm. Um, but yeah, it was a a lot of things happened in the background with the in our first season up there. Um, but other than that, I enjoyed my time in, in my first year uh, at the Blues, and then also with Auckland. Um, in the second year, obviously, we JK had just um, been announced as our new head coach um, at the Blues and. Uh, I don't think we we didn't lose too many players from the the year before, so you know it was a rebuilding phase and slowly sort of understanding all the young talent that was coming through mm. and how how much potential and talent they had. Um, the likes of like Frank Halai, George Moala, yeah. Charles Piertal, Peter Saeli, Peter Aki, you know. Yeah. Those boys, kids, coming into an environment environment like that, um, you know, so my hat started changing after that in terms of, okay, if I'm going to be a leader to help these kids come through, I need to be in better shape. So 2013, I was in pretty good, like close to, I was pretty much near my playing weight, mm. um, you know, and it was the first time I had a preseason. True, full preseason. Yeah, in a long time, <laughs> the old preseason. Oh, so I loved it. Oh, <laughs> I think I missed. There's a couple of sessions that I missed. The sand dunes was one of them. I wasn't there. <laughs> and then they tactical. went up by there. Yeah, <laughs> very tactical. <laughs> but I mean, like in terms of um, the rebuild, you know, yeah, trying to help nurture those boys and get them to understand, yeah. You know, the weird thing about footy now, I mean, everyone's talking about rugby dying, and there's a massive reason why. It's because these, I wouldn't say it's just because of the Auckland, Auckland schools, but these kids are 
getting scouted very at college. And then they go from college and going straight in, straight into a, a professional environment. Mm. But they don't know how to play footy. You know, they've, 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 they've gone, they haven't played one season in, in grassroots rugby at club level where I learnt my craft through all the old heads, the 100 cappers, the 200 cappers um, at, from the club. Um, listen to the stories in the club from all the old timers about yeah. their days in, in, in the in the jersey, and it's just like you know these kids go to school and go straight into professional environment. They haven't learnt the art of actually playing footy, mm. and especially in their in their role as a a nine, a ten, or even a prop. You know, so yeah, that's a good point. Trying to trying to help them out coming from college straight into um, Super Rugby yeah. and even NBC, you know, you're just trying to give them as much advice as possible around, mm. you know, seeing different pitches and understanding what pitches look like, shapes that people present uh, so that you can turn them inside out, break the ankles, um, you know, just just little little cues like that to help yeah. them understand. Um, rather, because I have a feeling some of these kids these days, like, because they've been taught throughout their career, this is how you do this, 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 and that. So and they get all the way to professional, and then they're like, there's no instinct. They don't know yeah. how to play a heads up, heads up footy. Like, yeah. there's opportunities to play, uh, like behind a pod, and then you shift it to an edge, but they just you carry, yeah. you carry, and then then they're standing there waiting. So when are we gonna have a go? Yeah, you know that's I, I find watching some of some of the footy a bit there yeah, a little bit robotic. Oh, massively! And you 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 were such an instinctive player yourself as well. Eh? You played a lot off field, and you were just like a natural baller. When you must see these guys who, like you say, so structured now at such a young age that they're not looking for the space. They're just sort of looking for their own team shape, not what's actually in front of them. Oh, exactly. But I, I think. Probably back then when I was a kid coming up, you know, I played every sport there was. Yeah. You get to college and they're pretty much telling you, no, you can only play rugby. You can't play basketball. You can't go play volleyball. Um, just in case you get injured, I'm like, right, okay, if you want to go and play any other sport at the same time and you don't get injured, bro, I'm all for it. Yeah. You know, you get, you've got to learn how to, how to read scenarios different. So you transfer that from one game into another. Okay. I saw him do that. Oh, actually, I can see him do the yeah. show me a different picture to, you know. How much of that did you do in your um, rugby career? How much league did you sneak off and play? I've heard rumours that you used to sneak off the odd Sunday and play, even when you're at the Canes and All Blacks, etc. Oh, those were my early days. My oh, early it? days when I, yeah. Um, I used to put a headgear on, try and hide, <laughs> use my middle name. Oh, true. Um, yeah. Encouraged by my father sometimes too, um, <laughs> but I would never play sort of premier. I would always go and play reserve game. Oh yeah, and just carve up. <laughs> oh no, nah, just I just wanted to be sort of out there, and you know, I found the development with it because they presented pictures that um, are different to some of the um, pictures you see in a rugby field. Yeah, um, with body shape and body language of, of individuals, and you know, with league. Some some of those some of them as defenders aren't great defenders when when you've got to move them mm. when they're lateral they're not used to it because they're all used to you running straight at them yeah um and that that's why you see so much massive hits because you know they're trying to actually run for a brick wall and they're getting absolutely <laughs> folded um but then when you actually see some of the forwards you know starting to ball play throwing a front door back door mm. putting their own teammates into space and um, you know, then you've got forwards running good hard um, lines to to either hold defenders, or if they don't if they don't bite, then you're just putting them into holes. So all that kind of stuff, I, I thoroughly enjoyed. Don't I you love missed. league, don't you? you, you oh, I do. <laughs> <laughs> I get excited. So I'm getting... coaching coaching my daughter's <laughs> league team. <laughs> oh, that's good stuff. And one thing that happened at the Blues, I think it happened at the Blues, but did you have a stroke at the Blues? Yeah, I did. Talk me through that. Like that's pretty unusual 
situation for a professional footy player. Like, yeah. obviously, it must have shocked you. Yeah, so we were at recovery, um, and uh, I was in the pool doing a few lengths. There was me, Peter Saley, I think it was George Moyler, and Charles Piotel. Mm. And we're obviously recovery. You do all your lengths, you're swimming, you're walking, you're stretching. Um, and we were just doing walking up and down down the pool during our lengths and all of a sudden like mid conversation I was just you know, they asked me a question, I'm like, Yeah, no, 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 no. And I'm like in my head I thought, Hang on, what's happening here? I, did I just mumble something and not open my mouth? But in my head I thought, Yo, this is um this is what I said. So I was actually, yeah, so I was like, kind of just, I wouldn't say, but talking like a baby. But you didn't know you were talking like a baby? Nah, well, I I did, but in my head I thought I was, you know, I knew what I was saying. Yeah. So I got frustrated, jumped out of the pool, got changed, and then walked, went to walk out, and uh, Benji was trying to get my attention because he went to my goggles. (laughs) <laughs> and like he was literally here and then I was like oh were you trying to get my attention he goes yes so, oh okay what do you want your goggles on oh, my bad so I, I walked out still frustrated jumped in the car and I sat there and I'm like what is going on here Um, so I started at the car I drove 50 metres because of my vision was getting blurry and in my head I'm thinking wait what's what's going on so I was rubbing my eyes squinting like hey what's going on here I'm just grateful that I was like about 3k's up the road 4k's up the road to my house drove slowly got home safely and then went inside and just sat in I was trying to I remember trying to text our team doctor to say help um, and I couldn't even text him so I ended up doing the old, uh, I thought, you know what, maybe I just need to have a nap. So I set my, I tried to set my alarm, clearly wasn't functional, so I was just like, oh, you know, whatever. So I had a, had a bit of a sleep, woke up, had a little bit of uh, speech in me, and asked my cousin to take me to the team doctor. I need to go and see the team doctor. Um... She drove me there. He wasn't there, so I gave him my phone and said, "Bring, ring the doctor." Um, we were actually traveling to South Africa that afternoon, oh. and so I hadn't packed my bag, and um, ended up sort of panicking a bit, like, "Hey, what, what, what the hell is going on?" Did you have any idea what it could be? What? No. Nah. Well, I thought it might have been the leg concussion from um, a game the night oh, before. Yeah. Yeah, and because I remember getting a bit of a head clash with uh, I don't know if it was Reed or, or Flinny, but um, I just thought, okay, maybe it, maybe it was that, and that's like super delayed. <laughs> mm. <laughs> but um, I remember going to our team doctor's uh, um, house, um, and he was talking about, uh, you know, he said delayed concussion too. Um, Maybe dehydration. I'm thinking. <laughs> well, I didn't do anything last night. So how can I be dehydrated? <laughs> I just peeled back a couple of those calories, and you know, maybe run into the funny part after that. Massive dehydration symptoms. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> and then his last one, he said, um, stroke. And in my head, I was like, Are you serious? No, thinking this potentially could be a stroke. Mm. Um. Well, anyway, we jumped on the plane to South Africa, went to Aussie, flew to South Africa, um, got to our team training, our our first team training the next day, and I started feeling real pale. Like, even he was, he looked at me, I was like, oh, sheesh, you're like white hairs. And I'm thinking, hey. So I had to sit down and sit out training for the rest of the day. Um... And I noticed that, like, I was struggling to retain our team patterns that week. Mm. Like, in my head, I'm thinking, I know 
this is like bread and butter for me. Why am I struggling to understand what's going on here? And so, yeah, it was yeah, it was bizarre. We were away for two weeks, come home, and I knew something was up. So I asked if we could go and get some scans done. And, um, yeah, we, we got a few scans done, done a few tests, and found out that there was a hole in my heart. All right. You obviously didn't play while you were away. We just... No, I played a couple of games. You played with it? Oh, far out. Yeah, I played. Is that dangerous or nah? How would I know? <laughs> I'm assuming if if you if you do know what it is right from the get go, yeah, yeah, definitely. But if you have no no um, understanding of it being an actual stroke at the time, yeah. just to continue and go. But yeah, we were playing. We come home and I was like, "Nah, man," I said to the doc, "Look, we gotta we gotta go and get some tests done. Something's playing playing up." I'm, Honestly, I have no idea, but I know there's something wrong with me. So, yeah, had a couple of scans, done a couple of tests, and found that there's a hole in my heart. Everyone's born with it, but no one knows whether it's closed or not. So, you, so when they did this bubble mm-hmm. test okay. um, where they put, I don't know if it's dye or something, but they can um, scan the, the ticker at the same time. And if there's bubbles that go on the other side of the heart, that's how they find out whether you've got a hole and if your hole hasn't closed or not. Oh, yeah. But the procedure to to close the hole was like five minutes. They literally put a slit in my main artery in my hip, put a, a line all the way up to the old ticker, yeah. and basically got to the position that they needed to put this little cuff link, so to speak, the way that he explained it, it's like a cuff link, put it one side out, open it up, pull it tight up against the where the hole is, make sure it's sitting right, and then they push out the other part of the cuff link, twist it off, and then pull the... Done. done. Good to go. Yeah, but I was, honestly, I was lying on the table just looking at it. <laughs> you can see this... Oh, you're awake. I was awake, bro. Oh, yuck. <laughs> I know, exactly. <laughs> he's, he's already made the slit, and you just, you're just you looking at these monitors while you're lying down like this. You're like, oh, man, look at that. That's pretty cool. <laughs> looking at this going all the way to my heart. And I go, oh, oh, are you doing that? Are you? Oh, my gosh, are you in my heart? <laughs> was it a massive ticker? <laughs> nah. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, it was freaky. But then after that, he once he unclipped it all at the end, and then just pulled the other thing, sewed it back up, and I was gone. Far out, man! That is crazy. Oh no! And so, and then you're good, like no issues after that, like no, well, I haven't straight back yeah. into it. I had uh, two weeks after that, two or three weeks, and then I was able to get back out on the field. Far out, man! That is that is one of the craziest the, yarns ever. Oh no! I was sitting. How long's the recovery? <laughs> Straight away, how long's the recovery? I don't want to be out for the rest of the season, guys. <laughs> and then you sign over in the UK, so with London Welsh, wasn't it initially? Yeah. What was the reason behind that one? Um, I actually wanted to go and experience uh, what the footy was like over that side of the world. Oh, yeah. Um, see what the premiership was like. London Welsh were in the premiership at the time? They just got promoted. Yeah, oh, okay. Um, but I played in the, we had a World Teams comp, um, and the coach was there. So London Welsh was there, and um, I had a yarn to the coach, and he wanted to know how, how the old ticket was. So, yeah, oh, no, yeah, all good, yeah. cuz, all good. <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, yeah, he got in contact with my, my agent, and um, we just kept in, in, in contact until, I guess it was time for me to, put pen to paper and mm. and see what it was going to be like. So it was, yeah, it was a, a new sort of experience. Obviously, yeah. they love their, their forwards over there in terms of smash and bash. And, yeah, different you know, style for you. Yeah, right? yeah, you spoke totally about, yeah, playing instinctively, like that's your that's your game. What, not so much over there, especially back then. Oh, eh? No, exactly. If you don't have a good pack, that's sort of, you know, to be dominant in set piece, 
in the field, um, you know, it makes things a lot, lot harder. But um, we had some some legends in our team that uh, you know, um, played for England. You know, Tommy May, um, Ollie Barkley, you know, just a couple of the boys to to name, and we even had a couple of Welsh internationals. So it was, you know, um, it was an all right team, you know, but just she was a bit of a bit of a drive to get to our home game, <laughs> so down to Oxford from uh, Richmond. So that was, that was a new experience, but um, my time spent there was was awesome. Like I I just enjoyed the whole. Um, journey, mm. um, you know, I was still bloody doing the extras with a couple of the couple of the boys there that had played Super Rugby um, that moved over there. Like my flatmate uh, was Lockie McCaffrey, who played um, for the Brumbies, the Tars. Oh, yeah. oh, true. And so he he met up. Well, he actually made contact with me to see if I was keen to to be um, flatmates. So I was like, and he was already there. So I was like, yeah, bro find us a pad and yeah mm. so it was good made some made some good mates over there and, yeah um yeah it was it was a totally different competition than i'm used to mm. um i think i still would have preferred super rugby just in terms of just the constant battles that you have trying to play chess and you know if you don't get get it right and you put too much of your bloody uh your big guns in there, you're going to lose your game. But um, over there, you're just smash and bash and make sure that you can last for 80 minutes. And if your your team's not up to it, you soon get found out. Yeah. And you went through four clubs in pretty quick succession too, eh? Like, I think all those contracts were terminated So by you, by you I think. So what was the sort of reason? Hey, were you just not enjoying it or...? No, I got actually loaned out to um to Wasps. Well, did you get loaned from London Welsh to Wasps? Yeah, it was oh, a weird, out. a real weird one because I don't want to to go because you know I my biggest thing was I got asked to go play for London Welsh and I wanted to stay there with the coach. Yeah, um, just because he brought me over and things like that. But he was like, "Nah, you should go." And I'm like, <laughs> "Look at her going." Because they were in this together. <laughs> well, hard. You're telling me to go, go to bloody uh, wasps. So I played um, a handful of games for wasps, and um, it was definitely totally different to to London Welsh mm. um, in terms of the setup and stuff like that. But you know, we they obviously brought or their owner at the time um, brought the state stadium out in Coventry. Yeah, and had all these massive ideas, and I was thinking, "Wow, was he really that loaded?" <laughs> Obviously not. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking might have just got a bit trigger happy on the on the market, but yeah, it was sort of uh, eye opener. Mm. After the season finished, I went went straight back to hang out with the London Welsh, Welsh boys because you know, yeah. I didn't really want to go to Wasp. I only went there just because you know the coach said that it would be a good opportunity for me, yeah. so. Went from uh, London Rush to, to Wasps and then got an opportunity to go, to, go and play in France mm. and uh, Oyona. Oyona. That's one of the ones I was trying to... Uh, it's a hard one, eh? You read it and you're like, wow, this could be pronounced so many different ways. <laughs> yeah. Oyona next is usually one of them. Oyana. Yeah, I would have definitely said yeah. the X. And what was the other one? Um, I, oh, Narbonne. Narbonne. I went to Narbonne. Okay. Silent E. Yeah, okay. Narbonne. How did you find it in France? Love the lifestyle. Yeah. The lifestyle was awesome. Um, and just the French culture. Yeah. Wasn't a massive fan of the, the, the footy. Well, not so, the footy was fine. I think it was more the mentality. Yeah. You know, they, they do, um, like, you're guaranteed, like, for my short period of time there, you're guaranteed to win home games. Mm. And then you send the academy team with a couple of internationals to the away games and yeah. you pretty much get slapped and I, I i i just couldn't quite understand it that you we've been i wouldn't say taught but we've been driven to be uh, winners week in week out mm. not win one week have a break one week go back to being winners again you just want to be competitive week in week out and so mm. 
that whole mentality for me was like, yeah, it was a bizarre one. I just, I couldn't understand it. Yeah. And, you know, some of their standards there weren't, weren't high. Yeah. And um, like, I remember one training session, I just, I had enough that the boys just thought it was a joke. You know, they couldn't even string a couple of phases together. Um, and we just continued it, and it was like, oh. <laughs> what did you do? I just walked off. Oh, did you? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, it's like you're trying to yeah. continue with something that that's just not going to be going to be good. So I just walked off, just needed to sort of like have a bit of a breath, take a break, and then go. And then I, walk, I, ended, up, I ended up walking back out. Oh, okay. But it was sort of just, I needed to. You were straight on the plane back to. <laughs> nah, 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 nah. Nah, bro. I just, because I wanted to be, you know, a leader there to help the club, like, yeah. you know, to be successful. But when you're trying to be successful and the team's standards aren't at a higher level, mm. you, you're not going to reach the potential that um, that you should. So mm. for me, it was, you know, if we can have our standards high here and try and maintain that throughout the course of the, our, our campaign or our season, you know, we should be able to compete week in, week out. But mm. when your standards are here on home games and then away games are down here, yeah. you know, it's just not a – it just didn't sit well at all. That's Plus, I lost, eh? I lost the lame love for the game yeah. over there just because of all that yeah. kind of stuff. Yeah. I, I don't think it mattered whether I was at a, 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 you know, a top team or not because you look at the competition and – all the top teams won home games and they target some of the teams that are sitting at the bottom of the table. Yeah. Because those are the ones that they actually need to win just so that they can stay in the top six. Yeah. So to speak. And then, you know, they've done their job. So So is that why you moved back to Warapa Bush? To get some love for the game back? Oh, I actually just moved home and just missed being around Farno. Yeah. Well, so you were pretty much, in your mind, had you finished playing footy? Pretty much. Oh, really? Oh, okay. Um, it was just my cousin. My cousin kept hounding me. Because <laughs> yeah. I was training with my cousin, Damon. Yeah. And um, he was just like, no, nah, I mean, I'm training at the, whatever, I'm tra- trainer for the bush. Come, you should come and play for them. And I was like, no, nah, I'm, I'm all good. It's like, I don't mind just training. Like, I was training four times a week with him. Obviously, he had no, no bloody job. I didn't know what, what I wanted to do next. And um, I just, yeah, I buckled and decided, okay, well, I might need to lose a few kilos uh, to, to actually start playing again. Mm. And um, went over there. Oh, actually, the, the coaching staff all came over to meet me and, you know, basically... Thing they asked, well, what do you want? I said, well, I'm not here for the freaking money, cuz. <laughs> Otherwise, I wouldn't have said yes. Um, but what I do want is a vehicle of uh, petrol vouchers so that, because there was about four or five of us that were traveling over. Oh, yeah, yeah. I said, as long as we can get a vehicle to go backwards and forwards um, and that the tank's sweet, then that's all I want. Um, they did give us match fees and stuff like that, but I said, "Look, I'm not here for the money. You can either keep that money or give it to a um, to a charity of your of your guys' uh, choice." Oh, what a lad. Um, and I just want to play footy, bro. I swear, the first two sessions I started like, "Oh my god, this is why I love the game." Really? Yeah. Like. Those boys over that side, farmers, the tradies, they're up early hours of the morning, grinding away on the farms and, you know, whatever trade that they're in. Come to to 40 at night, still got so much energy mm. and they're around, you know, hardly getting paid for whatever they're, you know, for, for showing up. And they just love 40. Yeah. And... Those first two sessions, watching the watching the boys, I was just like, "Yo, you know what? Yeah, I'll play. That's I want to cool. play." Uh, and then I just, by the end of the season, I 
totally fell in love with footy again and felt that that was the right time to hang up the boots. So, mm. yeah, even though I didn't play the last game um, through injury, but, you know, just to actually fall in love with the game again was, yeah. was huge for me and it was a sign that, you know, maybe now's the time to, to close that chapter. Oh, what a cool way to do it. And you spoke about injury. Like, how is your body now? Are you, is your body sweet? Oh, yeah, nah. <laughs> the old, uh, I've got arthritis in both my ankles. So, like I, sometimes I can hardly run around. I've, I've been trying to run around with my first fifteen boys at training, um, and like yeah, just can hardly move. Um, my right knee's bone on bone, so when it's a cold morning, she's uh, she's slow uh, to get up and get moving. So. Uh, yeah. Um, but other than that, like everything else is fine. But it's mostly <laughs> other than my knees and ankles. Yeah, and I'm good to the go. main ones to help you uh, move from A to B. <laughs> Trying to bloody run run races with your kids and thinking that you still got it, and then they run past you like, no, that's it. <laughs> look, we're going to be. Oh, we'll have another race soon. Not right now, but we'll look out. Yeah. <laughs> so how hard did you find that transition? Obviously, you picked up your TV show. We've, we've spoken about that, but the transition to go from not playing to finding that new identity oh bro it was tough like i'm yeah. not gonna lie it was tough i was at home doing nothing um sleep most of the day like what the hell are you up to bro mm. um and then obviously got the opportunity to um be the presenter for my tv series yeah. um not only that i picked up a few gigs for commentating yeah as well um, and it wasn't until possibly this year, actually, that um, you know I've actually got my first real well, my first real job. I'm actually a mentor at um, Wellington College. Oh, true. Um, helping out the meant to be the Maori students, but the way I see it is, you know, I'm there if I'm there, I'm there for all those students if they need someone to talk to. Mm. Um, you know, my doors are always, um, if I'm in my office, you know. Few of the boys start coming in now because they've gotten comfortable with me. So, <laughs> oh, awkward if I just chill out in here. Have you got class? No. Oh, yucky. Yeah, okay. But um, I've been enjoying that. Um, oh, that's cool. Even like earlier this year, when I first started my role at the at the college, and I had to shoot off to go and do filming, um, I was like, "Can we speed this up?" They're like, "Hey, what do you mean?" I was like, "I'm kind of missing my job." <laughs> you know, it's actually. Some like I actually had a purpose. Yeah. You know, when you when you go from rugby where um you've got that throughout your career but you know, you you're actually working on your craft and then once the boots uh and the lights and all of it are gone, you have gotta try and figure out, you know, what's your purpose in life after that? Mm. What's something that you're gonna love doing, um, you know, and that you're gonna enjoy doing on a daily day basis. So like I said this at a speaking engagement last night that, you know, after footy, I don't want to be going to someone's work and ruining their business. Yeah. Because I'm not 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 sort of invested in it. I don't love it. You know, if I'm going to do something, I want to be, it's a job that I love doing, that uh, I'm driven to, to help be successful, whether it's me or the people that are around me to be successful. Um, you know, Things like that, as opposed to rocking up in the morning with a shit attitude. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to be here, bro. Yeah. I'm just going to be an asshole today. Yeah. So with my role that I have now, I mean, honestly, I'm absolutely loving it. Of, um, you know, trying to help mentor groups of, of students, individuals, um, and, you know, trying to help them. But it's weird because... Yes, your teen students get to leave, have, have to leave the school ground, so you're trying to help them prepare for yeah, yeah, yeah. the big, big bad world, you know, and it's like, well, funny, I um, just finished that, and I'm just finally <laughs> found me something to Bring do. It together. <laughs> so, come on, yeah. let me try and help you figure this all out, you know. I mean, school's not for everyone, um, yeah. but, you know, the students that are there, you know, you want to try and help um, give them opportunities and, um, 
you know, try and constantly check up on them to make sure that they've still got their plan, they're still working to mm. to execute it. Um, so, yeah, it's been, this year's been, been awesome in terms of, uh, you know, nailing a job um, and loving it as well. And, yeah. you know, all the staff that I, I'm working with at, at Wellington College have been awesome. We've got a, uh, I mean, our headmaster is awesome. Um, Glenn Denham. He used to um, be at Massey. He's a ex-captain of the Tall Blacks. Oh, so if you need someone to, to actually get the team up, oh, he's not shy of a few good words <laughs> and uh, inspirational uh, chats. Um, so, you know, it's the way that he sort of speaks as well. It's, it's like, infectious because yeah. he's, he's actually caring about trying to get these kids set up so that when they walk out the, the gates for the last time, you know, they've got a plan in place to help them success, be successful in life. life. Mm. So, right. yeah, it's, honestly, it's been freaking, been an awesome year um, being a mentor at the school and, you know, trying to be organised and help things out there and on top of that, coach the many codes of uh, sports yeah. on the way. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, sounds like all good stuff and no doubt Wellington College are in good hands after listening to you here, man. You'd be absolute perfect mentor for any young kid going through school. But as always, we have gone to our Instagram for some questions, conscious of the time. We had thousands come in. I'll narrow it down to sort of the top three or four. Um, first question was, um, what did his props do to him when he was the Hurricanes under-18 captain? Oh, that's John Schwager. <laughs> I know that for a fact. <laughs> So uh, we're at, uh, was it Linton Army Camp, I think, in Palmerston North, and um, we got together as a as a squad, um, and uh, he knew that I was a Wellington boy, but because I went to Te Oute, played for Hawk, Hawke's Bay, yeah. um, he said to me, nah, you're Hawke's Bay. I was like, shut up, you know exactly... <laughs> Uh, where I'm from, I'm a Wellington boy. So basically, they got me into a room. There was about seven of the Wellington boys in there. Anthony Piranese was in there too. And I was like, mm, okay. So they basically said to me, number one or number two. And in my head, I'm thinking, are we going to toilet here? Or, you know? <laughs> but uh, there was definitely no to- uh, bathroom in the, in, the, in the room there. But um, they said, nah. I said, well, what's number one? They said, well, you can fight your way out of, out of this. I said, well, what's number two? And they said, well, we'll strap you to that to that chair right over there and you can, you can stay there. I was like, oh, well, looks like it's going to be number one. <laughs> Had a couple of props in my team that were in their bloody room, so I, was, I knew I was going to be screwed no matter what. <laughs> and um, so they basically strapped me to the, to the chair and uh, left me there for a bit. <laughs> and um, it was funny because... They did the exact same thing to Glenn Horton. Oh, yeah. And old uh, Hortz basically said number two right from the get-go. He didn't even try and put up a fight. I still, I still give him shit about that. So that's what happened uh, when we were in camp. Being the oh. captain, you would have thought, surely I get a pass. A bit more no. respect, eh? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> no, it wasn't to be. It wasn't to be. Oh, cracker. Okay, next one. What was the inspiration behind the two blonde patches in your hair? Was it two? I always only remember one sort of at the front. Oh, yeah, there was one at the back too. One at the back, yeah. Um, I don't know. It was just something different, <laughs> I think. I had done bleaching my bloody hair. Some of those didn't turn out the greatest. I think <laughs> one year I was rocking bloody the old orange hit, uh, mop. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, when we started thing, Namir, myself and Ma. Thought oh, we'd yeah. try and start a new new trend, trend. and yeah. get the old blotch of uh, blonde there. And I put one yeah. down down the back. Might only had his at the front, so might actually cut a couple of his um dreads off, so that he could actually oh, grow a bit of hair and have a little bit of a mohawk, but still be able to put the blonde patch in there. Oh, um, bring it back, bro! I think I've still got a patch where my greys are now. Is <laughs> <laughs> Is where my, where the I bloody got, patch I got those was, ones too. <laughs> <laughs> but it was just something different. The yeah. other one I was going to do, but um, Matt Gitter had done it. Was I was going to try and do a 
Davy Old Cross. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Strip, but you then I saw him it. do it. And I'm like, <laughs> we'll just stick with the with the uh, patches. <laughs> okay, next one. Um, what do you remember about the Robbie Fruin fiend? I actually thought that he was not my man. I was backpedaling, <laughs> thinking that. I think it might have been. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Bain and Kerr might have been inside me, and I thought, like in my head, I was thinking, "That's not my man. That's not my man." <laughs> And then looked up, he was coming at me, so I thought, oh, this isn't going to be pleasant. <laughs> he was thinking, you are his man. <laughs> yeah, hard. So I just, yeah. I just got put up, put on my ass. Yeah, that's it. That's all you remember. Oh, pretty much. Oh, no. I remember getting up and saying to the boys, because the boys used to give me shit about it, and I'm like, yeah, all good. But did you see what happened after? All you guys saw was uh, me getting bumped off, but there was a, I actually helped get a turnover there by <laughs> everyone being distracted go because I got bumped off and we turned the ball over and I started ru- it. <laughs> started rucking Robbie but I, I kid you not we had a we had a uh, camp earlier this year for our, our rugby boys and um, we had like a kind of like a quiz night and that yeah. showed up they they um, Phil actually put that that clip up and uh, I was like don't worry about that worry about like what happened next he showed what happened next and they were all like hey what the hell are you doing there I said you don't know nothing about rucking boys <laughs> you don't know you don't want to know what that is all about I'm, i think i still might have a few scars from all the rucks that i got in my career <laughs> jesus imagine if that was still going these days rucking oh imagine it eh? brutal Jeez. you probably would have got a, oh no you wouldn't have had a few would you Jimmy? I was at the very end of it, it just sort of come out, but in the club footy scene, that was oh, definitely yeah. a fair That was their favourite thing to do, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. Not even, oh, a, you're not even by the ball. young kid out of school. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. you got the old massive scars like someone bloody whooped you. Yeah, oh, good times, eh? Okay, I don't remember this tackle either, but did not Nonu ever apologise after he shoulder charged you to the next year versus the Landers? Oh, yeah, yeah, I remember that. I ducked the tackle from Hori, ball, ball spat out of the ruck, and I went to pass it, and Hori went to, to tackle me, and I I don't know how I got out of it. I ducked under it, um, broke through, and I knew, obviously, Nuggie was there, um, so I tried to make sure that I tried to push off Nuggie so I can try and get off. Fended Nuggie, spun around, and I was like, this is going to hurt. <laughs> but, Skucks come flying at me, shoulder charge me, and uh, as soon as I hit the ground, I, I remember going, oh, bro, that fucking hurt. <laughs> and then um, after, he goes, what did you get up? I said, you try getting up when there's a truck that hits you. You wouldn't be getting up that quick, mate. But yeah, I was thinking, how am I going to get this guy back after all these years? So even though we were best mates, you know, he was on the other end of the field. And then, yeah, I caught the massive hit from Skucks. Um, <laughs> but then we he caught up after and we went, sorry. I was like, you're not sorry. There was your one chance to put a hit on me. I know how this, this works. When your mates are on the other side, like best mates, you try and put a hit on them no matter what, whether yeah. it's legit or not. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I remember oh, yeah. I remember seeing a video of my, uh, my elder school um, when that happened in the video of her, she was quite young at the time. She was cute too, and she's like, "Uncle Ma'a hurt my dad," <laughs> <laughs> and now Uncle Ma'a has to get a timeout. This guy's obviously got Simbin, so. <laughs> but honestly, I remember that it was yeah, it was pretty funny, oh, and saw at the same time. <laughs> oh, that's crack up! Okay, last one. Best piece of advice you have for a Woodland listener. Ooh, depends if it's uh, and down the path of um, being a sports person. Um, I guess, you know, similar to what my upbringing was, play as many sports as possible. Um, try not to fixate yourself on, on, on one sport because mm-hmm. the amount of learnings you get from, from different codes. Um, like I played basketball um, growing up wasn't the greatest but you know the learnings i got from 
being able to, um, you know, learn about structures and mm. how it works, you know, things like that. And then you go away and play games like touch where you're learning how to beat players individually or you're trying to suck people in so that when they do come out, you can throw long balls to whoever's open on the edges. Um, to even netball, I played a lot of netball growing up, indoor and outdoor. Um, and it was just all the learnings that I got from every code that I that I played in sort of helped me see different different things. So mm. if it's a if it's a kid coming uh, coming through college, you know, don't be so stuck on playing one sport. Like honestly, if you watch um, players that know how to play with instinct, it's because their background is they've played flag touch basketball, yeah. bit of netball, yeah. um, anything to sort of help shape who they are. They even play soccer because, you know, you might be dominant in your right foot, but the more time spent kicking the ball with your left foot, making it so so natural. I mean, you look at Johnny Wilkinson and, and Desi, when, when they go, go to their bad leg, it doesn't even look like it's their bad leg. Yeah, yeah. You know, they're so accurate. And when they do shank it, you're just like, okay, Maybe you just didn't, uh, you felt rushed and, and hurried into making that kick. But biggest piece of advice, like, for me, continue to do what you did when you were a kid. Mm. Play as many sports uh, as you did. Learn off older people because, you know, you never know. I use all my learnings through rugby when I do speaking engagements to, to talk about culture, um, team culture, you know, hard times, um, you know, mental battles that I had with myself. Mm. Um, you know, I learned so much through footy. Um, and that wasn't just because I played footy. I played, you know, all these other sports to help me understand how to read body language of, of players in, on the field um, or even on a court mm. and try and execute something to make it, make it work in the team's favour. Mate. But yeah, I remember one thing was from, I think it was Michael Jones, he said, uh, reach for the moon, and if you don't get there, you will always be amongst stars. So I've kept oh, it, I've I always like kept that. it, kept there since then, so I've always tried to aim high, and if I don't quite achieve um, where I need to be, I know that I'll be around some great people. Mate, I like that. Even though the stars are above the moon, that is still a great quote. Mm. But that is probably why you're going to be one of the best mentors I think I've um, Wellington College will ever see. That is some great advice there to finish. What has been one of the best podcasts ever, almost two hours of phew, one of the best journeys and careers I I think we've had on the podcast. I really appreciate you giving up your time, mate. You were, you're an idol of mine growing up um, for the Canes. I used to love watching you play. So instinctive like we've spoken about, um, really just read the game so well and um, awesome to sit down and have a yarn with you and go through your journey and reflect on um, some pretty special memories. No, nah, bro. Thanks for having me. I've uh, thoroughly enjoyed actually, you know, just yarning. Mate, one of the greats. Appreciate it. No, nah, thanks, cuz. <laughs>